Ah, <sighs> my finest achievement. I could keep dunking on him, but honestly he makes more of a fool out of himself than I ever could hope to improve on. Stay you, common sense skeptic. Stay ableist. Stay problematic. Stay borderline racist. And most importantly, please, please keep trying and failing to get attention on Twitter, because it is just fucking hilarious. <laughs> Very shortly after I posted my previous video, Common Sense Skeptic commented, You should have just asked for an interview. Which he later edited to say, You should have just asked for an interview for the benefit of your 59 other subscribers. My commenters, being the chads that they are, called him out immediately for this. I'm sure he will hold you to that interview after he passes your sub count. Astro's content is more positive and funny anyways, and it's surprising the level of content for how little subs he has. His subs are definitely going to grow. To which he replied, don't hold your breath for either. You have no idea how much this shit has motivated me to do YouTube. I, I can't stress enough how much this comment fucking sustains me. But it is now time to move on from our dear friend Common Sense Skeptic. With that being said, did you know that only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed to my channel? So if you could hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications, it would be greatly- Hating on SLS is nothing new, but in recent months the level of hate has gone from bad to worse. In this video I will be talking about how, for now at least, SLS is still the most important rocket humans have ever made. Save for a small group of people, not many people seem to be sticking up for the SLS. Yes, I know Starship is very cool and very exciting. However, Artemis 1, the inaugural flight of SLS, is scheduled for November, a mere 6 months away. By the time I've recorded this, NASA has likely already started stacking the core stage. It seems the majority of the community has been so distracted with Starship that we've completely forgotten just how close we are to seeing this beast take flight. Starship has got a very, very long way to go before it's human rated. Keeping in mind, of course, that NASA is treating Artemis 1 as if there was crew on board. It's fully human rated for flight. In fact, there was talk of having crew fly on Artemis 1. For better or for worse, that didn't work out. So, let's take a look at the hardware of SLS, starting at the top with possibly the most exciting and groundbreaking part of the rocket. The Orion capsule itself was announced 10 years ago now, way back in 2011. However, its roots go back even further to 2004 with the crew exploration vehicle from the ill-fated Constellation program. Orion is one of only two capsules ever produced to be crew rated for deep space operation, the first of course being the Apollo Command Module. Orion is designed to get crew not only to the moon, but to Mars as well. Not only that, the Orion capsule, unlike the Apollo Command Module, is reusable. Orion can carry up to six astronauts, although for the first few crewed missions of Artemis, it will only carry four. The design of the capsule consists of an aluminium lithium alloy pressure vessel with an Avcoat ablative heat shield, very similar to the one used on Apollo. For additional thermal protection, the same type of tiles used on the space shuttle, you know, these ones, are used to cover the top part of the capsule. And I mean, come on, how cool does that look? Those thermal tiles will be coated with this shiny insulation, which helps keep the capsule warm in the shade and cool in the sunshine, and adds very much to its sex appeal. During launch, the fragile thermal tiles, along with the rest of Orion, will be covered by the launch escape system, and a boost protective cover, which protects from any potential impacts, and of course protects the capsule and crew from the solid rocket motor in the event of an abort. One cool thing about the launch escape system is the gas thrusters on the top part of the abort tower. With previous abort towers, besides a small rocket motor that would turn the abort tower towards the ocean, the trajectory was essentially ballistic, meaning the capsule would pretty much land wherever it felt like. But having these thrusters not only adds stability, it also adds the ability to actually steer the capsule during an abort, whether that's away from the exploding rocket or towards the ocean to ensure a soft landing in water. Speaking of landings, Orion's parachutes are based on the ones used by both Apollo and the Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters. Crew on board Orion will wear the Orion Crew Survival System suit during launch and re-entry, which is based on the Space Shuttle Advanced Crew Escape Suit. The OCSSS has a multitude of improvements to older shuttle suits. These include shoulder enhancements for better reach, a fire-resistant outer layer, and a, quote, 
re-engineered zipper, which is actually more important than it sounds because it allows crew to get suited up quickly. You definitely wouldn't want to be caught with a jammed zipper in the event of a depress. Also, not many people realize that Orion has actually flown quite a few times. It flew on MLAS, which we don't talk about, Eras 1, which we also don't talk about, it's had a pad abort test, an in-flight abort test, and even a crew rated mission on a Delta IV Heavy back in 2014, which tested Orion's heat shields, parachutes, and various other systems. All of these missions were successful. It is worth mentioning though, save from the Delta IV Heavy launch, all of the other Orions that flew were only boilerplates of Orion. Orion will work in tandem with the European Service Module, which has also been in development for almost 10 years. Funded by the European Space Agency and built by Airbus in northern Germany, it has four extendable solar arrays as opposed to fuel cells, which would require a lot of complementary hardware, including additional hydrogen tanks. The ESM has radiators on the side for thermal management and a lot of thrusters. It's quite clear that redundancy was a large factor in the design of the ESM. Its main engine, the AJ-10, has been used since 1957. In fact, a variant of the AJ-10 was the primary engine of the Apollo CSM, and the orbital maneuvering engines on the space shuttle are essentially what is going to be flown on the ESM. Its secondary propulsion system consists of eight R4D11 reaction control engines. These things are reliable as hell, and they have been used since Apollo. The ESM also has six other pods of reaction control thrusters, so all that means Orion has three different methods of producing thrust. The main engine, the eight secondary engines, and four RCS pods can all produce forward thrust. This is brilliant for contingency options in case the main engine of the ESM happens to fail. With all that considered, Orion will hopefully be not only the most capable, but the safest human-rated spacecraft ever built. For SLS Block 1, Orion and the European Service Module will ride on the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage. The ICPS is a slightly modified Delta IV Cryogenic Second Stage, which itself has already been flown 24 times. It has a single, highly efficient, stupidly reliable RL-10 engine for propulsion. For the core stage of SLS, there isn't really much to say other than that it's the largest rocket stage ever created, for now at least. Its tooling is similar to that of the Space Shuttle's external fuel tank, and it uses the same type, and in some cases the exact same, RS-25 engines that the Space Shuttle used. All four engines used on the core stage of Artemis 1 have already flown. The one with the most flights under its belt has flown 12 times already. The RS-25 is up there among the best rocket engines ever made. They are reliable and very, very efficient. Unfortunately, these reusable, flight-proven engines will be expended when used on SLS, which is a bit of a waste. NASA currently has 16 of these engines in storage, with each SLS core stage using four of them. That leaves enough currently available for four flights of SLS. That being said, NASA has ordered the production of an additional 24 expendable versions of the RS-25. These RS-25E engines will be 30% cheaper than their reusable counterparts. As I'm sure most of you know, the core stage of Artemis 1 has had its full-length hot fire test, and has now been transported to the VAB for stacking. This brings us to the two five-segment solid rocket boosters that will be used on Block 1 and Block 1B variants of SLS. Needless to say, solid rocket motors have kind of a bad reputation in relation to human spaceflight especially the infamous Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters that the ones on SLS are heavily based on. On January 28, 1986, one of the O-ring seals on the right-hand solid rocket booster of the Space Shuttle Challenger failed. This failure allowed extremely hot exhaust gases to impinge on one of the attachment points for the solid rocket boosters. The attachment point failed, and the booster struck the external fuel tank, causing the complete structural failure of the tank. This caused the orbiter to disintegrate due to aerodynamic forces. Seven people lost their lives. I don't want to gloss over how terrible the Challenger disaster was. It was a beyond tragic event caused by a frankly disgusting disregard for crew safety on the part of NASA managers, who ignored warnings from the engineers who knew how poorly the O-rings performed in cold temperatures. That, of course, combined with the black spots on the Space Shuttle's abort envelope. It's undeniable that the Challenger disaster was NASA's darkest day. The only good thing to come out of the disaster is that it will never happen again. NASA completely redesigned the O-rings, and SLS of course has a full envelope abort window, meaning that from launch to orbit the mission can be aborted at any time, and the crew can abandon any potentially exploding rocket and return to Earth safely. Of the 271 flights of the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Boosters, only one has ever failed. 
It's just a shame that that failure led to the deaths of seven people. SLS will use five segment SRBs, as opposed to the four segment ones used on the shuttle, giving a 25% boost to the total impulse of the boosters. Though using the same separation motors as the shuttle, the boosters of SLS will not be recovered. It's also worth mentioning that the five segment SRBs use leftover steel casings from the shuttle program. There are only enough segments for eight SLS flights, so after these are expended, the current plan is to use new solid rocket boosters developed by Northrop Grumman for future flights. These boosters would add 3 to 4 tons of payload capacity to translunar injection to SLS Block 1B, only 1 ton under Block 2's payload capacity. Speaking of Block 1B, this is where SLS starts to look really good. So Block 1B adds this chonker of a second stage, named the Exploration Upper Stage. It's powered by 4 RL-10 engines and increases the payload capacity to TLI from 26 tons to 40 tons. The exploration upper stage is expected to fly first on Artemis 4. Artemis 4 would launch in March 2026 if everything goes to plan. Actually, what is the payload capacity to Mars for SLS Block 1B? Hmm, around 32 tons. Okay. I wonder what the mass of the Orion capsule and the ESM is. Hmm. 26 and a half tons. Now that is interesting. That almost leaves enough mass for a potential deep space habitat that Orion could rendezvous in low Earth orbit with. Perhaps they could fly to Mars and meet up with a certain shiny rocket in Mars orbit. Maybe they could even land on Mars with said shiny rocket? That is an interesting thought. Is Orion even designed for a mission to Mars though? Oh, it, it is! Well, wow, blow me down, that is interesting. So. Now it's time to look at the negatives of SLS, and one often brought up by anti-SLS zealots <laughs> is the cost. <laughs> There's no sugarcoating this, it's a lot. The total program cost for SLS is currently 18.5 billion dollars. That's a lot of money, that's enough to fund like 1.1% of the F-35 program. In fact, even when you compare the cost of SLS to the cost of other well-known rockets, adjusted for inflation of course, it actually starts to look pretty damn cheap. There's also talk in the community of renaming SLS to Jupiter 4, both after the number of engines on the core stage, and Jupiter being the Roman god who placed Orion amongst the stars. A very fitting name in my opinion. My point for this video is basically this. SLS is based on older, but refined, and most importantly, flight-proven hardware. To conclude, Orange Rocket not that bad, and is going to carry humans years before Starship will. And even when Starship does carry crew, SLS by design, and by the flight proven hardware on board, will be much, much safer. We are going. Per Aspera, ad Astra. Through hardships, to the stars.